Awo, shalom, Rastafari. And now we want to touch on the subject matter that has caused and still causes a lot of confusion and speculation and and um, that has come into the news again, and this is circumcision. We want to touch on the subject matter of circumcision. Now, <clears throat> what you are looking at right here is from the Egypt, ancient Egypt, and it's from a particular um, tomb. And let's bring this up right here. It's from a particular tomb. And a sixth dynasty, a sixth dynasty uh, uh, tomb of uh, one named Ankh-Mahor at uh, Saqqara, Saqqara, and it portrays circumcision of two uh, pubescent age youths, two pubescent age youths. And there's an interesting story that's a company that accompanies this particular picture, and would like to share that with one and all. But since we're speaking on circumcision, let us um, speak on the matter of the degenerate, um, the, the old, uh, outmoded, and degenerate motherhood that has brought forward this practice here. This is a, a picture from female circumcision. Female circumcision is an abomination. The scriptures and, and logic or morality and, the, and science even doesn't prove proves that this is just a, this is the, the real brutal practice um, cutting off uh, females' clitorises and we have unfortunately we have some pictures actually of this but we're not going to um, you know show these particular pictures but basically let's make a distinction between um, true circumcision and this female circumcision or better uh, female genital mutilation now we live in a world where the where it's a world of confusion this present world system that we're in so therefore in this confusing in, in this confusing uh, situation um, a lot of the male and the female um, roles are not properly understood anymore Therefore, you have ones who are highly critical of um, male circumcision and try to characterize it in the very same way that female genital mutilation should properly be categorized. And this is a, this is an abominable practice. And this particular woman that you're looking at, that she's one of the practitioners, and this practice is going on in many African nations, including and especially, sadly, um, Ethiopia. But it's, it's based on a misunderstanding of, of, of history in the past and the proper contextualization of the mythos or of the, the early childhood education. And we're going back to, to ancient times. Now, the more proper, of course, the more proper form we have pictured right here. So let's bring... Let's bring this picture up from Anka, Anka Mahor's um, tomb or, or crypt. Now, there's a proper way and there's an improper way of um, circumcision. Now, here, if the senses would allow us, we'd like to show a couple of different um, circumcisions right here or uncircumcisions right here and some of the damages also that it can occur. And this is in, um, I think this is uh, either Japanese, this, yeah, this is Japanese, the writing here is Japanese, but it's a chart of the different types of so-called penises that there may be. Now, this particular subject matter in some, among some Christians, some Christians say, well, because they misunderstand what our brother Paul wrote, they will say, well, that's Old Covenant and Old Law and, and that's Old Testament and we're no longer under the Old Testament. Ask the Gentiles, when were they ever truly under the Old Testament? The only Gentiles that are, in a sense, under the Old Testament or Old Testament law are the modern um, convert Khazars and Edomite and Jebusite, uh, modern uh, Jews who we call the other Jews. And because of their conversion, to a form of Judaism, they are willingly, we can say at least initially, under Old uh, Testament or the Old Testament law. 
But the Gentiles, speaking about the Europeans and the Greeks, are not and they never were. See, this is a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of the Bible. Another point about circumcision, too, and I think we'll use this old book from um, the Nubian Islamic Hebrews right here that we have on You Must Be Born Again, and let us, um, okay, right here, this, this diagram right here. Now, what this clearly demonstrates is that this is, this is circumcision one, the first kind, circumcision uh, two, and this is circumcision three. Now, you can see under circumcision three, this is called the, a modern technique. And a modern technique basically following this particular circumcision two is the cutting off, the cutting off of the, the pubesis or the cutting off of the foreskin. And this is where the foreskins are pulled over the glands and cut off. But this is not the original circumcision. This is the wrong method. And this is actually what's being practiced today. Um, can we say it's better than nothing from a hygienic sort of perspective? We can say so. And a lot has been proven even considering the high age rate and HIV in Africa. A lot of that data, scientific data, needs to be understood in its proper context. You understand that the HIV is 60% effective I mean, at least the, the circumcision and preventing HIV contraction in heterosexual um, African males. Now, we know based on the ancient Egypt that, as we can see right here, that circumcision basically came out of Africa. It's clear to see that these are Afro-Asian males here who are both doing the circumcision and being circumcised. And we know from the Bible that the Hebrews, the original black Hebrews and black Jews, the Beta Israel, also practice circumcision. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And this is what this particular uh, vid is to at least inform ones. And we almost never, really we don't hear any of them making a distinction between the right way. Now this is the right way, circumcision one. Circumcision one, here we have the foreskin is pushed back to the base of the penis. And this is as it was in the days of the prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, salallahu alayhi wa salam, upon the, the prophet and the patriarch Abraham, that the foreskin was pushed back to the base of the penis. And as you can see right here, this, this cord, um, there's a cord on the underside of the penis that was, that was cut off, that was cut off. And with that cord being, you know, was going around, circumcising, going around, it's like, it's like a, it, what they call um, um, grafting in a sense when you deal with like plants, similar where you cut the stem. So that's like the stem, and then the glands are rolled back. And one must recall that this is done in the true religion or way of Father Abraham. This is done on the eighth day, on the eighth day, not when somebody is 80 years old or when somebody is, is, is 28 or 48 or 58, even though some may choose to do that. And that's a question that some brothers and even mothers have, have, have asked concerning their, their children who might not have been circumcised on the particular eighth day. But there is definitely a hygienic, from the hygienic and a scientific perspective, both for the males and females, a benefit to circumcision. But notice, as we want you to notice right here, the difference between circumcision one, method one, cutting that stem under the base of the penis and having the foreskin roll back. And as the child grows up, basically that would, you know, the, the, the body is, is, is very holistic. So the body basically absorbs that extra skin. You understand? The extra skin is basically absorbed as the child gets bigger, it becomes a man. And, um, even as the penis so-called gets bigger, and it's not there as a foreskin. Now, this is the method that they practice nowadays, this particular method right here, where the foreskin is pulled over the glands. And this is similar to the Marden, this is like a Marden technique. Now, this can cause a lot of harm. So those who say that circumcision as it's practiced today may cause a lot of harm, 
they are on to something. There's, there's also the scientific evidence that when it's done improperly, it can cause a lot of harm. But for us to understand circumcision, as we see in these three examples right here, the proper method, circumcision one, um, the modern, leading to the modern method, cutting off the glands. And we'll learn that from the Bible, there's a very important story that basically hints both that this is what began to be known as circumcision, pulling the gland over the top of the, 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 the um, pulling the foreskin over the glands and snipping that off. But by cutting that off is like saying that the Almighty didn't know what he was doing instead of here, where as a sign, it's, it's, it doesn't cut off any skin. You understand there's only a couple of drops of blood. You know that from this technique, there is a lot of blood. And it can be very painful and traumatic. This is the Gentile modern form of circumcision that often indubitably leads to this modern technique and may lead to e even certain problems, you understand, in the usage of the, of the penis. So there's the proper way. As we want to show this to demonstrate the proper way. And there is the improper way, the way that Abraham, Father Abraham practiced was this method right here where the foreskin is pushed back to the base of the penis, and this cord right here, and this cord right here is cut. Not this particular method here, where the foreskin is pulled over the glands, and the skin is cut off. That leads to this, and that leads to sometimes even nerve damage. Now, in color, we can see some examples right over here that we have in color. We can see some examples of the right way, and the, and, and the wrong way. Now, modern science, interestingly enough, modern science is proving the efficacy of circumcision. But let us, first of all, get to some of the root scriptures and the areas where circumcision has been mentioned in the scripture. As we as we've said, this is part of the true way, or some would say the religion, the faith of Abraham, which was accounted for righteousness. Now, there were other nations. We also get to learn that there were other nations which also practiced um, circumcision. There were other ancient nations, the Egyptians, uh, the Ethiopians. It's thought likely that the ancient Egyptians, uh, along with other, other science and other civilization that they got from um, the Osirens or the Osar, Osar and Osed, Osiris and Isis who came from Ethiopia, that this particular practice of circumcision was also a practice that was gotten or adopted from ancient Ethiopia and went down the Nile into ancient Egypt and then went across into the Levant with the Hebrews, the original ethnic Hebrews or the black Hebrew Israelites or the Beta Israel or the biblical Hebrews. But as we said, there's a lot of confusion, um, and a lot of this confusion is um, somewhat, uh, how can we say, somewhat purposeful out there because the, the, the enemy likes this sort of confusion about circumcision. This is why we thought it very important. Let's get rid of this woman there. Thought it very important to um, to to highlight this matter. Let's first of all get to the root of circumcision. Let's pull up. Let's pull up uh, right here. This is a close up of this wall painting. Okay. Now, as you see right here, this mean this is Zuria. Zuriya, which means circumference. But in the same measure, circumference as circumcision means to go around. Go around. You remember the cord that we show at the base of the penis? There's that cord or that stem. Now remember, all of this is to be done in a certain order. And it's unfortunate that many people nowadays are not in that particular order. Now people learn that there's a medical benefit. There's a particular medical benefit. A benefit to um, circumcision and therefore many people are speaking about it and many people are circumcising again. This is ironic that circumcision actually came out of Africa, out of Ethiopia 
to ancient Egypt, other nations learned and adopted the method and adopted the, the practice from there. As we see also right here, this is, this is uh, Megiddo, Megiddo, Megiddo ivory right here, which some say that these two men over here, let's bring them into, into frame, these two men over here who are captives might be um, Shemites. There's someone who is on a cherubim, a cherubim throne. Some speculate as whether this could be a picture of, of um, some say Sheba and maybe Solomon. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation on who this can be. We can clearly see, even in this, this one right here, um, some of the, the black hairstyles and features with a little exception right here, but then I've seen this sort of an Ethiopian profile in some Ethiopian woman right here. So possibly it can be, though there's still a lot of speculation on this. But the reason why they focus on this particular picture here in some studies is that these two males appear, they say, appear to be circumcised. They appear to be circumcised right there. But we can get into that particular that particular um, picture and some of the history about that. But what we want to do right now is let us go to let us go to the scriptures. Let us go to the scriptures right here, and let us go to uh, where it was first mentioned in uh, 17 and 14 in Genesis 17 and 14 in Genesis chapter 17. And uh, verse uh, 14, verse 14, and it says, Yeah, quella fatuna siga, yala te gareze, quella faso hulu, yach nefs ka wagenua, teleita, titifa, kala kidanena, athera salechna. It says, and the uncircumcised man child, the man child. It's very important that we note and observe that it says right here, the man child. This is why we say that female genital mutilization under FGM, under the disguise, the vain disguise of so-called a, a female circumcision. There's really nothing to do with cir circumcision in that. And in fact, you can liken the female genital mutilation and so-called female circumcision to this modern technique that actually cuts off the foreskin and is not done in the proper context nor in the proper timing. But here it says, here is where it's mentioning about uncircum uh, circumcision versus uncircumcision. Circumcision was established as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Circumcision was established. So when we now go to Egypt and we look at the, the glyphs from Egypt, including this one from Ankh Mahor's um, tomb at Saqqara, or Saqqara, we find that it was practiced among the ancient Egyptians. Now to put the whole verse here into proper into proper context, because there's more to this, but we want to deal with some of the exo, the exoteric, some of the basic knowledge, some of the basics before we get into some of the esoteric and the metaphysical or the higher level teaching. We need to understand what's there on this basic, this basic world or sense level, the out of the physical level before the metaphysical. Now, here it says that Elohim said, to Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed. Now it's interesting that it says seed, because seed can be understood as race. When you see seed in the Bible, you can and should understand that as race. The seed is race. In the Ethiopic, in the Hebrew, in the, the is to say the Ethiopic, in the Arabic, the word for seed is race, and the word for race is seed. It says, every man child among you 
shall be circumcised. Verse 11, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins. You shall circumcise the, the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now let's understand this word token, because we said that the skin was not supposed to be cut off. Now some would say if they misread this, well, it does say token, and like they'll think about a token that you put in the train or something like that. But here where it says, it says verse verse uh, uh, 10, where it says, it says, be, be inena, be ante makakal, ka ante ma bechala, be zarihe makakal, ye mitat avuk uta kala kidane, yihino, ka nante wend hulu, yigares, ka nante from you all, wend male, hulu, all males yigares, all male will be. Uh, to be let him be let all males be circumcised. Now here it says Yekwala Fetachu Nima Siga Te Gare Zalachu Benena Be Enante Mekaka Lalumak Alakidana Milikit or Milikit or Milikit Yehonal. Milikit means a sign. This word right here in the Amharic that has been translated over here in the English as token. This is says token. Milikit means a sign. So now this is interesting. If milikit means sign in the Ethiopic, in the plain, peshat, targum, or targum, it means sign. And token is token in the English, like a token Negro. Think about that for a moment. A token Negro, is he a sign? Is he a sign of something? Well, of course, because the, the N-word is that byword for the Beta Israel, the be another proof positive of who this lost sheep really is. But here it's saying that it will be a milikit, milikit yehonal, yehonal. Now, here's the key information as we go to verse 12. It says, and he that is what? Eight days. It doesn't say eight years. It doesn't say 80 years. It doesn't say 28, 38, 58. It says eight days. It says, yes, cement can lij yigarez. Be beitu wa yetawallade woim kazarachu wa yaidele. Be berimma ka ingada so yetageza wend hulu. Be tu ledachu. Yigares, and he that is eight days old, he who is cement uh, uh, ken lij, shall be circumcised, Yigares, among you. Every man child, or literally every male, every male child, that means every black male of Abraham who was of his seed, as well as, it says, he that is born in the house. He that is born in the his house, in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, or one who is bought, which is not of thy seed. See, here's, here's the important indication right here about that seed. You understand? Who is not of thy race, or who is not of thy seed. Some would like to say that race was not here in the Bible, but really the Bible, a lot and much to do about it is race. Now, here in verse 13, here in verse 13, we find is it reading, It says that he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, or literally thy silver, thy bur, you know, saying thy silver, the bur him, yet geza, it says, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh. Now, this is part of the flesh covenant for the seed people for an everlasting covenant. So we see that when the Africans have gone away from the covenant, 
and followed after strange gods like we see in Africa today. They, they barely even know how to make their land fertile, although it's the most fertile and the richest place in, 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 on the face of the planet Earth. It's the very location of the Gannett to Aden, of, of that garden that was in the Aden. It, it is the Gulf of Aden, duh. I mean, you know, people don't want to get it, but that is the approximate location. But we now find that the AIDS and HIV rates in Africa and cervical cancer and other like diseases can be stopped up to 60% as well as UTI infections or, or um, urinary tract infections can also be reduced. But there's a big controversy, controversy among the Gentiles concerning circumcision, concerning the circumcision. Why is that? Because simply it was never given to them. Yes, they can benefit if they are circumcised, especially in the right way, but it, it's not part of their culture or their historical legacy. This is why it's been so hard for them to properly explain it. And this also explains the wrong form of circumcision that we just highlighted at the beginning of this particular lecture. But there's a certain importance of circumcision that's found in two other places of the scripture. One is Exodus 4 and 24. Exodus 4 and 24. So let's touch on Exodus chapter, chapter um, uh, 4 and verse 24 of 4 and 24. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 24, it says, And it came to pass by the way in the inn that Yahweh met him and sought to kill him. Now, this is the incident where, where our Coptic and, and Egypto-Hebrew or Cushite Hebrew brother Moshe, Moses, was now going to return. He was returning to Egypt. Moshe was returning to Egypt. And it appears that he did not circumcise his sons. Now, if we were to read this in its full context in Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, um, let us see if we could bring up a, a, graphic, a graphic for the screen presentation, one of our Moses uh, graphics. We could use that one right there as well, too, for, for a mosaic um, graphic. But um, because this is the word, uh, kind of a word picture lecture presentation. And since we've been deceived by racism and white supremacy, we have to reverse the curse by also focusing on those elements when it is necessary to explaining the context, further explain the context and the meaning. Okay, let us, let us have this open up and we'll bring up, uh, bring up another graphic here that can be uh, used as a, as, a, as a placeholder for, um, for Moses, you know, Moses, because a lot of us seen the Charleston Heston, the Charleston Heston nonsense, and, and a lot of that's still in your mind, that Charleston Heston, Heston nonsense, you know, that whitewashing and, and racism. That, that has a strong role to play. A lot of, a lot of idiots or misinformed people would like to tell us that, well, it, it, it really doesn't matter, you understand, what race Jesus is. It's a lie that they tell. It matters what race. If it didn't matter, they would have never painted a picture and never keep trying to force that, you know, force that false image, the false imagery on us. Um, let's see if we have a, have, a, have a picture somewhere in here that we can use. Um, if not, we'll just, we'll just continue and move on with this particular uh, presentation without, without a picture. Um, all right, well, let us use the, the, a, a close picture, though it's not an ac a accurate picture, but another, another particular picture, um, ironically. I think this picture was put out by one of the beer, the beer or the alcoholic companies. Um, it was a good picture, kind of accurate. Did highlight some of black history. It was one of the few times that Amheiser Bush, 
the Germans did us a good turn in this to a degree. You understand? Amheiser Bush. So let us use this picture, although this was after the Mosaic time. This this period of Ankenunten was after the Exodus and after and after um, the the Mosaic time. In fact, Ankenunten was inspired by Moses and the Israelites to reform the religion of Egypt and not the other way around, as uh, some um, misinformed and false scholars have have told one. So here we have Moses about to return to Egypt, right? And it says that Yahweh said to Moses in Medean, when he was in Medean with his, his, his Ethiopian father-in-law, Jethro, Go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Similar to the New Testament and the Christ. That there was ones who sought the, the, the black, that black baby Yeshua's life, and all those who sought his life was dead, and then the family could return from, from Egypt called my son out of Egypt and returned to um, Judea. And Moses, here, Old Testament, Exodus chapter 4, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass. And he returned to the land of Egypt. So here Moses has a wife and has sons. And he sets out upon a donkey or an ass and he returns to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God. Moses took the rod of God. I think it would be appropriate for us. Um, give us one moment right here to bring up to bring up another another particular um, word uh, pick right here. Let us go to Moses. Let let us search this out right here if we can. Do we lose this? Okay, here it goes. Now it's engaged. All right. Let us search out one of our mosaic pictures. So now, here is where Moses now is told that, well, he has, he, has, uh, he has the green light, and he can return to Egypt. We're not going to use that Moses right there. You understand that whitewash? It's kind of look a little demonic, that Moses right there. Um, we're not going to use Heston, Charles Heston boy. You understand? This would be a good, and, and probably it's maybe very accurate. It's, it's an it's a old Moses shot, but... We'll use one of the ones we're a little bit more, um, a little more comfortable with. You understand? So here, here we have a black Moses, and it's important because he has the the rod. If you notice, he has the rod of God. The rod of God is is in his is in his hand. So now he's setting out. He's setting out to return to um, to, to to Egypt with his Ethiopian. Um, Medianite wife and his two sons. So, verse 21 says that Yahweh said to, to Moshe, to Musa, to Mashu, when thou goest to return to the Geber, uh, or the Gibbet, the Gibbet to Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh or the Pi. The Pyron or the Pyra, the Pyro, the Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. So now Moses is said to have this particular rod of God, the rod of God in his hand. Remind me of the Garnet Silk song that said that um, um, music is the rod, you know, and we are the people, if you recall that. He's one of our martyrs, Garnet Silk, but still his songs is an inspiration like Burhana Selassie. So these are some of our Kedusan. These are some of our martyrs as well. But he says that music is the rod. You know, he compared music to that particular rod in that sense. Something to think on. But here, Yahweh is saying, I who are Yehu, is saying to Moshe or Mashu that when you return to the Gabbata or the Gibbet, to, to Egypt, as it were, that see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. So this rod that Moses has in his hand can do certain wonders. Remember the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles 7.22, it says that Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians, or more correctly, in the wisdom of the Egypts, of Upper and Lower Egypt. 
And these are some other related images that have been ascribed to Moses. Here is as a hierophant or as an initiate. And just one other picture, um, this one right here as a, as a Moses. And something about this picture has a resonance. I don't know about for, for, for you all, but something about this, this is obviously from either some wall painting, some Romanesque type of wall painting perhaps in Egypt. We haven't been able to locate it, but it says under it, Moses. You understand Moses. So this could be a similar face to that one who fled. You understand? Prior to that, this could be a similar face to the one who was, who was initiated as a hierophant. You understand? And this is now him returning, returning to deliver, to deliver his, um, to deliver his, uh, his people. You understand? God's people out of Egypt and from that, that captivity. Now, the New Testament speaks on spiritual Egypt. That means we have to understand the old Egypt to put these new, this spiritual Egypt into better context. But here, in connection with um, circumcision, Yahweh says to Mashu, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. Well, since we are doing this particular presentation in this particular way, it would probably do us, behoove us, and do us well to show you, and this is a, what they call it, what they, what they call it when they um, restore it. This is so-called Tutmosis restored and it's interesting that when they restored him they seem to have um whitened up his his particular features but let's let's put these two brothers right here there's these two brothers right here there's moses who was actually the rightful heir because he was the adopted son of hat shepsut and he is tutmos the third and tutmos the third and he is said to be by us and the evidence to be the pharaoh of the exodus, the pharaoh of the exodus circa 1440 or so, 1440, perhaps 41, perhaps 1439. You understand? But this is the, the respective time that we are speaking of with the historical evidence that backs it up. But now Yahweh says concerning this particular pharaoh something very, very interesting. That it says concerning this particular file, it says that, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people, that he shall not let the people go. Now the Schofield has a footnote that says, in the face of the righteous demand of Yahweh, and of the tremendous attestations by the Ta'amrat or the miracles, extremely, uh, extremely scientific. Um, events, basically, that's what a miracle is. When you look up the Ethiopic, it shows that the root of miracle is knowledge, actually. That he was indeed God, and that Moshe, that, 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 that Moses and Haron were his representatives. Now, Peron or Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now, instrument tally Elohim hardened Pharaoh's heart, or Pharaoh speaking about the great house, the, his administration, as well as this particular Pharaoh's heart by forcing him to an issue against which he hardened his own heart in refusal. So it was because of the issue that Moses requesting the freedom of the people, this caused Pharaoh, Tutmosis, Tutmosis, something that Moses is actually Tutmosis. And this is maybe one of the reasons why we presented this in another video, why they um, have uh, uh, changed his features and sought to um, Europeanize in some way, raise up his bridge and narrow his nose. And, and, and we've seen the older, the older version of Tutmos the third. You understand? So either they're going to tell us that the older version is not Tutmos the third, or admit what they did. So we have we have proof that they have been tampering with a lot of ancient Egyptian archaeology and art and facts. But the good thing is enough photographs have been made and published 
over the past 200 years of Western Eurocentric Egyptology that we can actually compare and contrast, you know, the differences and the, the perhaps the changes that they have made. But light was rejected. The illumination and the light was rejected by this particular pharaoh, the individual and the whole administration of Egypt at that time. And right obedience refused. Inevitably, this is what hardens the conscience. And conscience means with knowing, with knowing. So we have a very interesting story of two potential, of, of two potential ears. There are two potential ears in this story. There is Pharaoh who must have thought that Moses actually has a prior right to the throne, even though there's the issue of the murder, you understand, of the Egyptian. never tells us who that Egyptian was. Some of us speculate that Egyptian actually could have been Shepsut's half-brother and um, Tutmos II, II, actually. He could have been the particular Egyptian that was um, killed because it could have been just a commoner. But the, 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 the scriptures are, are Moses it is silent on that particular issue in his second book, the book of Exodus. But moving forward, verse 22, And thou shalt say to Pharaoh, Thus saith Yahweh, Israel is my son. Now religiously speaking in ancient Egypt, this is a very interesting time as well. In, in, in the sense of where the religion is at. Now, most folks kind of give a very dumbed-down view of, of the religion and what's going on. They try to act like, like the Egyptians um, always had the same interpretations or applications of everything, and that they worship the sun god, Ra. That's all that people are really taught. But they said the devil's in the details, and when you get into the details, you find a more interesting and a biblically compatible story in the details. And we thank, we thank our Godfather and the Moshiach, our black Lord and Savior Yeshua, for ones like Gerald Macy and others who had the courage and the boldness to present his documentation and information. And, and pointed to the true Ethiopic root and origin, both of ancient Egypt and the Hebrews being black, and, and uh, shaming the European madness that we call today racism or simply white supremacy. Now, here Yahweh says that thou shalt say to Pharaoh, thus saith Yahweh, Israel, Israel, is my son, even my firstborn, even my firstborn. Now, the significance of this is lost on modern bibliolators and Bible scholars and other biblical pundits. They lose the significance of really what's being said here. They think like, well, well that was crazy. Pharaoh was crazy for not letting them go. He should have let them go. I mean, he's big time foul. But there was more to it. There was more to it. You understand? There was much more to it. Verse 23 says, And I say to thee, let my son go. Let my son go. So here, even in the Old Testament, we have the breaking daylight of the Hebrew or Jewish trinity. Here in the Old Testament, it's very important to understand this, that Yahweh is saying that he has a son. And that his son in this sense and context is the Beta Israel. And now Moshe or Moses, he's the point man for this particular revelation. So let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And this is another evidence that we can rightly point to Tutmos. Uh, to Hutmuse Sostenyal, you understand, or the third, you understand, Thutmose is the third to being that Pharaoh, you understand, because he had two sons. Most know about the second one, but they don't know about the first one, and they found his remains, and they said he must have died kind of, he was a young man, you know, and, and, and he had died, and it doesn't appear obvious, like it was like he was hit over the head or something like that, and he died. 
you understand that he was murdered, but it appears that some unexplained sickness or illness or something hit him, but he was a fairly healthy, seemingly healthy young man. So Yahweh lays down the conditions. Verse 24, and it came to pass by the way in the end that Yahweh met him and sought to kill him. This is strange. Yahweh met who and sought to kill who? It's obvious that Yahweh met Moshe, Moses, and sought to kill him. Well, what's the reason? See, this is one of those unexplicable parts when you ask. This is why a lot of churches don't have Bible study. Because, you know, a child would ask, why did Moses is sending him? How are you going to send him and then want to kill him? How, how are you going to do that? Mm-hmm. Well, they tell us to be smart people asking questions, but then religiously, because they want to sell you a lie, a counterfeit, a whitewash, you can't ask questions about it. You just got to be naive. Well, my, my Lord, you understand, my Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, he says something to that. Um, it's very interesting what Yeshua says to that. Yeshua says that we shall do what? We shall um, know the truth, and it's the truth that shall set us free. So, yes, belief or imnet or mamen is very important, but that is to lead us. It's like you have to have faith in your teacher in order to begin the process of learning. So Yeshua Yeshua says to us, or our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So our black Lord and Savior and the true Jesus Christ of the Bible is a Gnostic. He's about knowledge. He's about knowing. In fact, his father, our father, is about knowing too. He says, my people perish or are destroyed or are lost because of a lack of knowledge. He says that the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel, my people, doth not know. They do not consider. Consider what? Well, first of all, for us as the lost sheep, our people don't, do not consider, well, who they are. You understand? As Beta Israel. But now, let's un understand why and how this has to do with circumcision. The reason why Yahweh wanted to kill Moses, according to what's written here in Moses' own book, the second, his second book, the book of Exodus, or read the Art. It says, then Zipporah, then Zippy, Zipporah. Now, we don't have a picture of Zipporah, but since she was a Medeanite and an Ethiopian, perhaps we can utilize one or the other, you understand, of these uh, images from ancient Egypt, since we see that the people were very stable in their culture and very stable in their styles. Let us... Let us, use, uh, let us use this picture right here. You know, let's use this picture right here. Um, the so-called black Isis right here. Now, it's clear since they speak about the, the Ethiopians and the complexion. This is Anef right here. This is Anef right here. But let, let us see her, right, the wife of Moses. And she was the the daughter of Jethro, who has, seems to, it seems like he had many names too, because some places he's called Jethro, Raguel, um, 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 not, 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 not Horeb, but um, I think Horeb too. He's, he's, he's got a couple of names in the scriptures, or we can use this particular picture of, of, of uh, Zipporah as well. You understand? Zipporah, a daughter of a priest. It seems as though the, the Hebrews were quite fond of marrying Ethiopian women, it seems like. I mean, we know the Hebrews are black, but it's very interesting to the, kind of point out that particular fact. And a lot of their, the daughters that they married were daughters of priests. You understand? Were priest daughters like, like Joseph as well. So there's a very important Egyptian connection to this. And we want to note right here our revised, um, our revised. Let's get a full, a fuller shot of of Israel's debt to Egypt, which we have published. This is a, a, a new edition that we've published of this old particular book. It's very important to get a copy of this particular book, as there's a lot of information that was known years ago, but this book was suppressed. 
because it also helps us to easily make the point of the blackness of the Beta Israel, of the Israelites of the Bible, and it's called Israel's Debt to Egypt. You can go to our website, www.lojsociety.org, and you can order a copy of this new edition and this new printing of this book, Israel's Debt to Egypt. So this is a very good reference and, and um, a, a, a reference source here that we utilize. So we want to point that out as well. We'll get into that a little bit more. But why, oh why, did Yahweh want to kill Moses according to Moses' own book? You know, that's not something that most people would write, like the guy that I serve wanted to kill me at the same time. For what reason? But, but look how the woman, you understand, the Ethiopian woman, you understand, or the black woman came to the rescue. Look how the black woman, the Ethiopian woman now comes to the rescue. She comes to Moses' rescue. Right? We have in verse uh, 25, it says, Then Zipporah, which interestingly enough, it refers to like a, a little bird, uh, almost like the, the, the Horus, the Heru bird. And we know the Egyptians were very fond of birds. It means like, um, like Dinbit or like little bird. It says, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin. It says, Cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Now, this is very interesting. Remember, we talked about there's two forms of circumcision. There's one done on the eighth day, rolling back the foreskin and cutting that cord, just like one would do in, in, in horticulture. And why we say horticulture, because when you look at the whole idea of grafting, you understand the whole idea of grafting, like in plants and, 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 and in agriculture. It's the same principle there. The stem is not cut off, but it is, it is split or it is spliced, either to roll back, such as the foreskin, or either to, to combine another type of a plant, you understand, to that living plant so that it can grow. Now, Zipporah, she took a sharp stone. And she cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet. And she said, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Uh, I wonder if this is where the British folks kind of get this, this overemphasis of everything bloody this, bloody that. So even that's Ethiopian, ain't that? That use of bloody this and bloody that, that's an Ethiopian because she's an Ethiopian woman. Zipporah, the wife of uh, Mashua, Musa. So he let him go. Wow. So he let him go. Then she said, a bloody hu husband thou art because of the circumcision. In other words, because you did not do this on the eighth day, according to the Abrahamic imnet, you see, because remember, the Medeanites were descendants of Abraham's third wife, who he married, obviously, according to the Bible, after Sarah, his sister wife, after she died, he married again Keturah and had six sons with her. And one of those tribes is Median or the Medeanites. And here we now catch up with Zipporah and her father, a high priest of Median. And so these are the people that Moses is dealing with. In other words, fellow relatives, and they're part of that seed. They're part of that Abrahamic covenant. So it's not too much of a stretch to imagine that they understood the importance of the circumcision. After all, we, as we have right here from Ankh Mahor's uh, sixth uh, dynasty um, tomb at Sakara that this was practice, that circumcision was practice as a rite and as a ritual. Now, we've learned already that it is a token or a sign, a, a, a milikit. It is a sign for, for the generation. But it's also a sign for regeneration, too, because now we learn even more the health benefits to circumcision. The, 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 the anti-AIDS and HIV among heterosexual, as well as the UTI reversing the, the infections of the ur urinary tract infections, male circumcision, female so-called circumcision or genital 
of female genital mutilation is an abomination. It's abomination, and it should be stopped if necessary, even by force, even for it to, to pose as though it's like a balance to the male circumcision. No, it's being done by evil people, and it's an evil practice, period, period, because we're going to trace the origins of that and show you what an evil practice and how that actually came about. And, and it's, we just listen for a while and see if, see if any of these these scholars and intellectuals and the rest of them that have the cornerstone on all of our ancient heritage, if they can bring forward the real reasons for this first. It's obvious that they, that they, that they can't and that they have not. Now, it says that this is because now she reveals the poor has the spiritual wit and wisdom, the chokmah or the sophia, the wisdom to recognize that the reason why Yahweh had met Moses and sought to kill him has something to do with the circumcision. And then Yahweh said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. Go in the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and he met him in the mount of God. Notice that? Have you noticed that very carefully? That the mount, there was already a pre-existing mountain of God. I wonder, did the Egyptians know about this? Well, of course they knew about this. You think there was a mountain of God. And kissed him. And Moses, Mashu, told Aaron all the words of Yahweh, who had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. All of the what? The signs. Now, here's the key about what Zippi or Zippora, Sipara, Sipara Bamarinya, what Sipara had, had done to save her, her husband's life. That Yahweh had commanded Moses on what to do, right? Had, get, had given a command to Moses. But there were already previous commands that was given to even Abraham. That was part of the family's, for lack of a better word, treasure or commonwealth. You understand? A commonwealth. Now notice, they already have proven that circumcision reverses, not reverses, but it prevents, rather, the HIV infection, you understand, um, contraction among heterosexual African males in Africa, it, or, or, as well as uh, cervical cancer among females, and, you know, having sex with men who are not circumcised, so forth and so on. Now, we know that a lot of you all may not be circumcised, might be circumcised, and therefore because of whatever your status or situation is, you might have an opinion on that. But this is not to judge or condemn anyone, and circumcision does not mean salvation. Let, let us make this clear, because there's a whole New Testament controversy around circumcision and salvation. This is what Hawadi Apollos is writing about. He's saying that, yeah, circumcision was something that was given to the fathers, to our forefathers, and for good reason, too. But it's not one of those things that we should force the so-called Gentiles to submit to, you understand, to force them to submit to that for spiritual salvation of their, of their souls. It's not about that. But many of the Jews and many of the black Jews, too, had fallen astray from the true spirit of God and were misusing religion. It's similar to what's going on in the black church and the prosperity preachers, so forth and so on, even today. That misuse or abuse of Jah's word. And though it may not bring an immediate retribution, because Yahweh is merciful and compassionate, Mahari Yikarbaino, you understand? Still, there is a judgment if there's no repentance and, and amendment of one's ways. So, now, in this section here in Exodus, there's a footnote. The footnote says this, and it's very interesting, the footnote, because it points us to Genesis 17 and 14. It says, the context, verse 25, what Zipporah did, interprets verse 24. So, when we get to verse 25, the context of verse 25, it helps us to understand what occurred in verse 24. And now Mashu, or Musa, the head of the fraternal order of the Lewawian, a priesthood, a brotherhood even. Moses was the head of a fraternity, of a brotherhood that was known as the Lewawian, and as, and as the Hebrews. 
he became that head of the Hebrews, and the Hebrews are an ancient order of Egyptian priests, or we could say Ethiopian priests, but an ancient order of Yahwist, of Yahwist priests. So even we find that Yahweh and the worship of Yahweh was known by the ancients and even by the ancient Egyptians. Let us make no mistake about it. But here, Mashu or Musa, let us bring up Mashu or Musa right here. Moses, he was forgetful. Forgetful of what? Well, forgetful of one of the major signs of the covenant. Because if that sign is not carried out properly, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have a sick and a diseased people. You're going to have a sick and a diseased people. You understand? If that sign is not carried out. Because we, we now understand the hygienic value of circumcision. Not just for the male, but also for the female as well. Now Moses, we know he was circumcised. But Moses was forgetful of the very foundation sign, which was the cornerstone sign of Israel's, of the Beta Israel's covenant, Al Kidan, word agreement relation to Yod He Wow He, to Yahweh, to Yahweh. On the eve of delivering the Beta Israel, on this very eve of delivering the Beta Israel, Yahweh's son, he was thus reminded that without circumcision, without this rite of circumcision, a Beta Israel was cut off from the Al Kidan, was cut off from the covenant. Now, there's a, another relation to this. We have another note to this. This footnote gives us a further note, and it takes us to Joshua chapter 5. And let us go to Joshua chapter 5. Now, we're in the season known as Sukkot or booths or ingathering right now. And we mention that because there's a particular mishtir that Moses no doubt was learned in concerning Shu and Anhur, Shu Anhur, Shu Anhur. And it's very interesting when we start to study this, and this is something that we wanted to present, but um, we are still in preparation um, of presenting a, a word picture presentation on that because it's very important to see some of the facts and the evidence of what's being talked about. So when you hear this, you can now you have a have an image to go along with that particular word, an appropriate image. And because of seeking to search out the right and the appropriate images for the particular Sukkot, the expanded Sukkot or the esoteric Sukkot teaching, we've been somewhat delayed in that particular presentation. But there's more on that. But there's a connection with some say that Joshua is 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 a regeneration in the sense of Moses, or that Moses' second act, in a sense, is as Joshua. Now, there's a very interesting mystical, metaphysical connection, even in the Bible, that is explained by the monuments and the mysteries or the wisdom of ancient Egypt. But when we get to chapter 5 of Joshua of Iyasu, or Yisha ya uh, uh, Yehoshua, actually Yehoshua, or contracted as Yeshua, the very same name as our black Lord and Savior, we find the reproach of Egypt is rolled away. The reproach of Egypt is what? Rolled away. Now, let's understand this with Gilgal. I think the place, the place is Gilgal. Now, Gilgal is a Hebrew word, and a simple Targum interpretation of Gilgal in the English would be a rolling, a rolling away. Now, it's very interesting, and let's, and let's bring this up right here. This is from one particular site that um, went into some um, explanation, a little bit of explanation of this particular, this particular imagery that we're noticing right here. Let's move it over there. And it has to do with rolling, well, rolling and rubbing. Rolling and rubbing. Let's put, let, 
Let's put, um, okay, now the second youth, you see there's a second youth right here that also stands before a squatting, they say, mortuary priest. They add in mortuary because they found it in somebody's tomb, priest, right? In, in, in figure three. So when we go to figure three, let's get a close-up of figure three right here. And in figure three, this would be this, this one right here, or based on the wall painting, it should, on the wall carving, it should look a little bit like this right here, figure three, if you can see, figure three right there. And that figure three is this particular figure here. So this is, this is a more of one can say um, uh, artistic uh, uh, representation, a pseudo artistic representation right here. Let's see if we could bring up figure three. Figure three should be behind here. Um, Let's expand this because then when we compare and contrast um, what, 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 what it actually looks like, what it's supposed to actually look like, right, um, and what they show us, it's as different as night and day. Well, let's, let's do this like this. Let us kind of copy, copy and, 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 and paste this particular picture here so we can put it side by side with this this very colorful imagery this colorful imagery that has been that has been um, uh, made for Taurus in Egypt Taurus in Egypt basically okay let's just bring it up like that so it says right here next to this particular uh, mortuary figure a uh, mortuary priest. It says the second youth also stands before a squatting mortuary priest. His left hand rests on the priest's head. The right hand is by his side. To he says to the priest, thoroughly rub off what is there. The priest who holds the penis in his left hand and is preparing to operate with the large flint knife, the same kind of knife that um, Zipporah, Sipata used, respond, I will cause it to heal. Two separate individuals appear to be represented, but